Hi everybody. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we're going to get into uh, module five's or module six material. So we're going to talk about deviance and criminality and such as that. Um, really, this is the part of sociology that usually stems into criminology, um, which has its own place, I guess, and its own distinct place within sociology. Um, we're going to first talk about like the social functions that get to all of these things, the basics, and then we're going to get into kind of how that plays out in society. Um, so first we're going to talk about norms. Norms are those like those things that a society creates, those rules, those ideas, those fundamental properties that um, decide what you can or cannot do in any social situation um, and what is expected of you in social situations. And when you follow those or you adhere to those, you're adhering to the norms of society. And so really those are just, again, um, say, let me give an example. So a normative, when somebody comes up to you and says, nice to meet you and holds out their hand, would be to shake their hand um, and then say, it's really nice to meet you too, right? Now, again, that normative changed a bit during the pandemic, right? So that normative changed to really social distancing, a wave or a nice to meet you um, without kind of that physical contact due to public health. This is an example of how... Um, norms can flow and ebb depending on how society operates. And it can be something as little as that or something as big as there's a normative in our society that you can't just go kill people, right? Like that normative itself is directly proportional to the laws that relate to murder um, and so on, all right? Um, and every every cultural group, every group of humans in society has societal norms. Now, those norms are going to vary, but that doesn't mean that the group itself does not have a societal norm. And then the next group won't have a societal norm and so on and so forth. And those norms make up the fundamentals of what you can do or not do within a given society. All right. So there are different types of norms. Uh, norms. So you have morals, mores, which are just norms that are widely adhered to. They're just kind of they're they're the normal stuff. They're the greetings. They're the things that you don't really have to put out in law. They're things that you socially learn. And then, then you just socially participate in. Um, and when you don't, they have minor infractions. They have minor kind of consequences in the sense that somebody's going to call you out or somebody might tell you you're acting funny or somebody might tell you you're acting weird um, or something of that nature. But the violations aren't generally like substantiated by law. Folkways are norms um, that guide casual everyday interactions. Um, okay, I got those backwards. I am sorry. Um, mores are the ones that are sanctioned in laws and really are sanctioned in like a wide, uh, carry a wide scrutiny. And then folkways are this little bitty social interactions that I was just speaking of similar to like the handshake or something like that. I apologize. So deviance. Deviance is a mode of action that does not conform to the norms or values held by most members or a group in society. Some deviance isn't necessarily considered bad, right? So you're going to have deviance depending on what kind of, if you're not the normative or the um, higher up in the hierarchy, but you still embody that positionality with some kind of resilience or some kind of strength or some kind of... Um, characteristics that we value in the world then or and or you're intentionally rebelling against a normative sometimes that deviance is necessary to evoke change in the society or sometimes that is necessary to show the inequalities that are inherent into a system that has a normative that creates identities as normative and identities as inherently deviant and we're going to get into that a little more here in just a second um, what is regarded as deviant is variable, again, just like the norms and values. It's different between the different cultures, subcultures, or what have you. So, for example, um, if you go in full goth attire with the spikes and the uh, black nail polish and the, you know, all black hair, um, all black dress, what have you, to, let's say, the class you may be looked at 
like you're not the norm. Now you go to a particular kind of social setting or say a rave or some kind of um, musical event that is catering to that particular audience then you are going to be the norm because you're going to be dressed in a similar fashion you're going to be as that subculture so just because you're not a normative in the main culture hopefully all right apparently there's a fire truck going by um but so just because you're not acting on a particular norm that is in the main culture doesn't mean that there's not a subculture that fits that particular norm. Another, I like another example is cosplay for Comic Con or something. You get in Comic Con and you're going to have an entire subculture that is going to be relative to itself and it's going to have different rules and norms to adhere to. And if you don't dress up, you might be the one that's abnormal as opposed to if, say, you're the one doing, you're in cosplay walking down the street. Um, not around Comic Con, and that person would be the one that's like breaking the norm, if, if that makes sense. Um, so, forms of behaviors that are highly esteemed by one group may be regarded negatively by others, and that's just kind of what we're talking about here, right? So, um, depending on the the place you're in, depending on what it is you're you're trying to accomplish, um, you're gonna have different normatives you need to adhere to or not adhere to. Um, deviance is not limited to individuals. It concerns the activities of groups as well. So deviant subculture is a subculture where members hold values different um, that differ substantially from the majority. An example of this is Heaven's Gate, a cult established um, in the early 1970s, um, whose ideas resulted in the mass suicide of the followers. Okay, so that's a really radical example. But so you're going to also have deviant subcultures in things such as like Heavy metal, heavy, uh, so like heavy metal, um, particularly that brand of music is going to have a subculture within a wider culture. Um, and that subculture of music and those who listen to it are going to adhere to different social norms, especially when they're in particular social settings like music venues or um, social institutions, such as uh, maybe outdoor gatherings or like um, festivals of, or not festivals because you have music festivals. I don't know what the name of them are or the name of the equivalent of a music festival would be for a heavy metal group. But um, so you're going to have situations where essentially those subgroups are, are deviant to a broader society, but at the same time um, don't pose this threat like a cult would, right? There, it's a different, it's a different kind of deviance. You can also think of activist groups as a deviant subculture to an extent, but that's got its own flavor as well. Um, all norms in society carry social sanctions. Okay, so social sanctions are just essentially the consequences you get, or positive or negative, to an action that you create or to some kind of um, normative you've either adhered to or broken. Um, and so, again, a really good example of this is Say you're walking down the street, you're a guy walking down the street or whatever, and you wink at a girl that um, you see and you think is attractive. Um, if that girl kind of like shows you the social cues, like chuckles or waves back at you or says hi or something to that nature, then you have been given a positive social sanction to that particular action that you took in that social setting, right? Um Say you ask for her number, but she says, um, I don't know you or something to that nature. That might be a negative um, social sanction to the um, social interaction that you just had, had tried to adhere to. Um, so laws are rules of behavior that are established by the political authority and backed by the state power. So laws are essentially your social sanctions, but they're taken to another degree because they're built into a in social institution, which is your um, whatever legal social institution you have or whatever authority social institution that you have, depending on the society. Um, and then crime is a result of any action that um, that essentially goes against any laws established by the political authority. Now, that doesn't always mean that 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 crime per se has the same social weight as another crime. So you're not going to see the same social weight uh, in littering as you are going to see the same social weight in somebody who 
is a serial killer or somebody who um, maybe hurt children, right? Those are all going to come with different kinds of social sanctions and different kinds of punishments and different kinds of laws that are adhered to. In the same token, say you have a law like we did during the Jim Crow era that demanded that um, individual black individuals had to sit at a different par- portion of the bus than did white people. That's going to carry its own particular um, brand of crime, right? Those crimes and committing those crimes intentionally by maybe protesting and sitting on a different part of the bus than you are supposed to and or um, and or being part of someone who is actively telling others to do this is still technically a crime, but those crimes are going to look differently for the social sanctions depending on the community you're in and depending on um, what comes of it. So if it creates social action, sometimes those crimes our social sanctions might get social, might get positive social sanctions as opposed to negative ones if you are part of the marginalized group that is trying to express an injustice, if that makes sense. All right, so why do people commit deviant acts? Um, some of the first attempts to explain um, crime really emphasize biological factors. And then we realized that the methodology was kind of shaky, right? So if you go into a whole bunch of people who have been arrested and say, hey, what qualities do you all have the same? And then you attribute those same qualities to say they all had curly hair in that prison by chance, okay? So then if you make that to a broader picture and you say that everybody that has curly hair has an inherent like predisposition for crime, that's not gonna work because you're not actually doing the wide population of somebody, like people with those, those particular qualities and saying, hey, these people with all, all people with these particular qualities have this predisposition to crime. Instead, you're saying, hey, all these criminals have these predisposition or have this particular trait, which does not necessarily mean that those two things correlate. I hope that makes sense. Um, a, a prime example that was used was the, um, was the example of bedwetting and criminals, okay? So there was a predisposition that those who were bedwetters would then later um, um, be become criminals or become specifically, I think it was serial killers. Um, but the problem with, again, that methodology was they were showing that a lot of criminals in the system were bed wetters when they were younger, but then weren't showing the general population of those who had that issue and what might else have caused that, right? So they weren't looking at medical conditions that might've caused that. They weren't looking at other social factors that might've caused that, that the bedwetting might itself have been a a um, factor of some other cause. Um, and that predominantly most people who wet the bed when they were younger didn't end up turning into serial killers. So while yes, the majority of serial killers bed wet, bedwetting wasn't a predisposition or a marker for serial killers mostly because that data was collected in we'll say with shaky methodology um if that and i hope that explains it better if you're still having questions about that please don't hesitate to ask me and i'll clarify even better um so um the biological view again of deviance really um takes a more nuanced approach it emphasizes biological factors, um, maybe um, physical trauma to parts of the brain, um, certain kinds of uh, uh, certain kinds of maybe social anxiety or social kinds uh, special kinds of um, trying to think developmental issues, um, trauma histories, things of that nature. Which actually trauma histories they're not going they're going to consider more of a social factor, not a biological. Um, although it does change your physiology. Um, the this perspective emphasizes that gene environment, trying to find the the serial killer gene, the gene that you can pinpoint and possibly cure or change to make crime less, or that you could possibly. Um, predict if somebody was going to have a predisposition, say, in the same way that you could addiction or maybe smoking or something of that particular nature. Um, the psychological view of deviance really was talking about it, uh, criminality with 
particular social personality types. So you're talking about a psychopath, which is um, those who lack a moral sense or a concern for others. So really lacking that empathy, really lacking that ability to connect on a personal level to someone. Um, and that link to that um, tending to have more violent crimes possible because um, it was very clear that they weren't feeling a, a sense of remorse in any way for any kind of violent crime that was happening. Um, so these can, again, they're good at kind of describing the rationale for why someone has the propensity to maybe commit crime, but not necessarily why the crime itself starts to happen or what builds that. Um, and same with biological, we can, we can figure out some, some things that are, that are trends that, um, typically happen in those who do this. It doesn't necessarily fit the whole picture though. It doesn't necessarily always really show us a really good determinative for, for who's going to commit crimes and what kind of crimes they're going to commit. Um, so contemporary sociological thinking really looks at crime that emphasizes the definition of conformity and deviance. Um, the, that's based on social context, right? So just like everything else we're going to talk about in sociology, we're going to talk about how social context might um, might enhance your risk and or create intentionality or need to commit a crime in order to survive maybe or to put food on the table or to um, or to maybe get out of a dangerous situation or what have you, what have you. And we're going to kind of get into that. So the types of crimes committed by affluent are different really than those who are committed by the poor. And this was something that we were seeing fairly regularly, right? You're going to see your white collar crimes, which are more fraud based, which are more money laundering. They're, they're less, um, usually less violent in nature, but usually affect far more people in one go um, versus those who are poor. You're going to see a lot of theft. You're going to see a lot of, um, assaults you're going to see a lot of domestic violence you're going to see a lot of these things because the social pressures and the social stressors to meet basic needs are are much higher um so a functional a function a functionalist sorry um are really going to argue that crime happens when aspirations or individuals do not collide with available opportunities so um this is going to be it's it's essentially saying that it's part of society right Part of society is the fact that you can't always access the resources you need. And so those resources and or that safety is going to be created by you. And thus without kind of these laws and these social sanctions and all of these things, society would not function. I don't want to make a sticky note. I want to keep going. Okay, so Durkheim really was um, a big portion of this um, having this conversation about uh, social functionality. And he talked about anomie, which is a concept that's used really widely in, so uh, in sociology. And it refers to a situation in which social norms lose or hold, lose their hold over an individual, right? So this is gonna be a situation where someone might get disoriented or anxious. Um, and, and he's particularly talked about this in reference to suicide, right? So if somebody gets really, um, really disconnected from, say, the group, from, say, society, feels like they're in on an island on their own, whether it's socially, whether it's um, uh, financially, whether it's just a lack of being able to hit the social norm when it comes to body types, say, or when it comes to certain kinds of um, maybe when it comes to a certain type of identity, right? And all of these things can create such a distance for yourself that you can feel the need to not um, be alive anymore and commit suicide. Um, and so that's kind of, he, he saw crime and deviance as inevitable elements of modern society um, where there is a lack of a room for individual choice in a lot of things. Um, and he talks about it as necessary and he says it's an adaptive function that brings about change. So without, without deviance, you're not going to have, and th this gets back to kind of what I was talking about, about how, um, say the deviance of not choosing to be at the back of the bus created, um, and, and or boycotting the bus system 
in Montgomery, Alabama, created a situation where we needed to reevaluate the laws as a whole in society and figure out that this 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 group of humans also needed to have um, political weight and needed to be able to um, have the same rights as others when it came to writing the public transportation. Um, and again, that was a, a, a tinier fraction of a much larger social movement. However, um, it's kind of, it's, it's a good example of how to kind of have that conversation about necessary and adaptive function that brings about change. Deviance also promotes boundary maintenance between good and bad behaviors in society. A criminal act can ultimately enhance a group solidarity. So essentially, if we all agree and we're all striving together to say, make um, laws to protect domestic violence, kids in domestic violence situations, right? Say as a society, we all decide to get together and we decide to make this federal law that helps to protect these kids, okay? Then as a society, we're gonna feel like we have done something good. We're gonna feel like we have created a safer society for our next generations or so on and so forth. And so that's gonna create, Durkheim's gonna talk about how that's gonna create some some um, solidarity within our, our social groups, right? Um, now that doesn't always work, but that's, that's an example of, of how this might be looked at. Um, Merton talked about deviance as a byproduct of economic inequalities. Um, and so this is gonna be really important. And, he, and Merton directly um, is impacted, um, well, we'll talk about that in a second. But he really split people into five possibility types is how they responded to tensions um, between socially endorsed values and the limited means they have to achieve. So essentially this is when we're, and in these situations we're talking about when your economic needs do not match what it is you have to go against in society. So for example, you get out of college, you've gotten your degree and the money you make currently does not pay both your rent, your food and your ability to pay back your loans, okay? There's gonna be a, a tension there between, hey, I'm trying to do what is socially endorsed. I'm trying to follow the steps that people say will help you succeed. And then being smacked in the face by the limited means of actually achieving that goal of getting out uh, into middle class or getting into even um, able to afford all of your bills, right? And he talks about these five um, types of people who, like, essentially, this is the type of thinking you might have in that situation. You're going to be a conformist. And if in that case, you're going to be like, okay, I accept that this is really like what I've got. This is, this is, this is what this is. And I will figure it out somehow, or I'm going to work with what I've got. You've got the innovator who's going to essentially be like, um, wait a minute. Um, I need to figure out a workaround in this situation to figure out how to make my, um, make my means better or achieve something. And sometimes those innovators are those innovations are accessed through networking as opposed to like, I created a new product and um, now I am seeing the reward for that, right? Um, you're gonna see a ritualist, a ritualist, which is really gonna turn to like maybe religion or some kind of other, other entity or other institution in order to really um, talk about or think through why it is that these two things don't match being there. Um, means to achieve certain social hierarchies and or the the social positionality that they want. You're going to have the retreatist, which is essentially going to be those who are that maybe Durkheim talked about where they're going to experience a lot of anomie, where they're going to experience a lot of um, give up. They're going to feel very socially isolated and have really a hard time. And then you're going to have the rebel who's going to be like, nah, this system doesn't work. We're going to fix the system. Let's do this. Um, who's going to be really energized by the fact that um, this particular avenue is not available to them. And, and this is what, what we're going to get into. Um, and it kind of really talks through all of what I just talked about. <laughs> um, but so Merton also wanted to answer the question that at a time when society as a whole was becoming more affluent, 
why did crime rates continue to rise? So like why as people were becoming more successful or having more means, did crime rate also increase? And he identified the contrast between rising aspirations and persistent inequalities. Um, and that was that was a big thing, right? Relative uh, depreciation, which is really just when a person feels like they're comparing themselves to a higher standard or to the social norm. And he, if the social norm is this American dream, say here, right? Where you're going to go be rich and be a millionaire or billionaire. And you're going to have everything you could possibly want. You're never going to have to worry again. The amount of people that are going to actually achieve that versus the amount of people that are going to strive for that and not have the means to achieve that is going to be totally different. So when you have a social normative that is not actually viable for the large percentage of the population, you're going to end up with this clash. You're going to end up with this, this situation where those inequalities and those persistent inabilities to um, meet that social normative is going to come to pass, right? And he saw this as an important factor in how deviant one was going to be. Um, so subcultural explanations and individual will follow rules when they have the opportunity to do so and break rules when they don't. So you're going to fit into a subgroup. You're going to fit into the general society. And if you're still achieving essentially the things that that society is promising you or that thing that you are striving for, then you're going to keep doing that. But if you keep butting up against these no's, if you keep butting up against these, this inability to be able to acquire those things or to achieve those goals, then you're going to, you're going to have an issue, right? Um, subcultures with deviant values develop in response to a lack of legitimate opportunities for success. And we kind of talked about that a lot. Um, and we should not presume that the middle class values are accepted throughout society. So just because a normative might be middle class, I think sadly we've set our normative a little higher than that, um, doesn't mean that that's necessarily the normative everybody else is trying to get to because there's a lot of different subcultures we have in this um, country and there's a lot of different ideologies that we have in this country that make um, presuming that that middle class values um, are what everyone is striving for doesn't work. So interactionist theories are really going to talk about deviance um, as something that they reject the idea of some type of some type of conduct or that. Okay, let's try this again. Reject the idea that some types of conduct are inherently deviant. Instead, they ask why only some groups get labeled as deviant. So this is really going to be talking about instead of the acts of deviance as an individual situation. And they're going to talk about how one's individual actions and or lack of actions are interacting with society's assumptions of, of, of a person based on any kind of subgroup or group that you are a part of, whether by choice or by identity marker. Um, so differential association is an interpretation of the development of criminal behavior Post by Sutherland, according to whom criminal behavior is learned through association with others who regularly engage in crime. So this is one of those things where, say, you have a kid in a neighborhood with very limited um, access to maybe like a part-time job or something, but is in need of means of some kind of monetary value or maybe might even be underage to work. Um but then say he sees a lot of other people in his neighborhood join a gang and that particular gang provide some kind of economic means or some kind of means that he could not access otherwise and or does not or is very limited access otherwise that comes with a lot more possibly discrimination or scrutiny. And so because of that, he's going to end up being around this gang and end up engaging in far more crime than maybe he would have with different um he or she, I guess, um, would have with different, in a different social setting, if that makes sense. Um, but because they are around a gang, they end up doing gang-related activities. Uh, the term differential refers to the ratio of deviant to conventional social contracts uh, or contacts. Um, we become deviant when we are exposed to a higher level of deviant persons and influences compared to conventional influences. And this is a wide range, right? So again, not all deviant behavior is necessarily um, trying to form some kind of negative interaction, right? So some deviant behavior is going to come from this idea of social change. 
And so if you're around more people who are activists, there is a large chance that you are going to also become activist and be a deviant in a social in a social format in this particular way, if that makes sense. So I use the option of a negative, but here's also the option of probably a positive way in which being around other deviant people could help you become uh, more deviant. Labeling theory is an approach to studying deviance that suggests that people become deviant because certain labels are attached to their physical, to their behavior um, by political authorities or others based on usually um, things like race, things like gender, things like sexuality, things like um, identities that uh, maybe immigration status, things that you may not have a whole lot of um, option, other options. I mean, you can't change necessarily your racial status in this country um, without societally uh, society agreeing to that. Um, and that that comes with a level of labeling that comes with the ideas of what it is people perceive your race to be or what have you. Um, so primary primary deviation, uh, according to Mert, is the actions that cause others to label one as deviant and secondary deviation um, is um, the act of primary deviation. Second is following that act. And it's when an individual accepts the label of deviant and acts accordingly. So you're going to have society that is going to essentially place this label on you. Say, for instance, for black men in the society, there's already an inherent um, deviance or like you're going to see a lot of representation of like the thug or the drug dealer or what have you that gets portrayed by a particular group. That is because someone has labeled that group society, some someone with a lot more status and power has labeled that particular group as deviant. Okay. For this, in the same way, you might see Muslim men in this country as automatically labeled as terrorist. Um, and that's due to a lot of different things. It's a lot of media. It's a lot of political embellishment into um, particularly what what a, a group that was othered in our country already, um, how they're going to act. And so in primary deviation, these people are going to already know that society kind of views them in a certain way based on the actions they've already had and or the actions of others like them that they have seen. And so in primary deviation, right, they're going to they're gonna know that they have this label. In secondary deviation, they're going to be like, well, since I already have this label and no matter what I do, people are going to think of me this way, I might as well be this way right? This, this is just going to be who I am at this point. And so that's kind of what um, they were talking about with labeling theory. Control theory is a theory that views crime as an outcome of an imbalance between impulses towards criminal activity and controls to deter it. So, right, we have social standards, social um, interactions that tell us what is good and bad, right? Whether it's um, our parents as we're growing up, whether it's the social interactions from maybe a school teacher. Una, hush, sit, stay. Thank you. Um, so this imbalance um, between that ability or really the power that we give a control mechanism um, versus the the maybe how we want to interact with society or like how how we view that criminal activity um, is going to face or depend on how much control that 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 particular um, that particular force that's telling us not to do that is going to have on us um, control theorists hold that criminals are rational beings who act to min maximize their own reward unless they are rendered unable to do so through other social and physical controls. Mm -hmm. So control theorists claim that there are four types of bonds that link people in society and law-abiding behavior. There's attachment, ref which refers to the emotional and social ties to persons um, who accept conventional norms, such as like a peer group of students who value good grades and hard work. Commitment, which is really just those who are invested in in 
um, investment one makes in conventional activities to achieve goals. Um, involvement is really one's participation within um, a particular institution or a particular social group or a particular social setting. And then beliefs, which is really your morals and values that you're taught throughout your life. Um, conflict theory is the argument that deviance is deliberately chosen to often um, and often a political in nature. As inequalities increase between the ruling class and the working class, law becomes the key instrument for the powerful to maintain order. Crime occurs when that concept of inequality or that context of inequalities or um, competing interests among social groups, right? So this is, hey, there's not enough resources. There's consistently not enough resources and there's inequalities that become barriers to those resources for different groups. So what ends up happening is these different groups have to work harder for those things and or don't have any access to them, period. And that requires a deviant behavior in order or a criminal behavior in order to achieve those particular means. And if those means are shelter over your head, um, then maybe there's a that justification for crime becomes different, right? Um, criminal and respectable behavior can, exists on a continuum. Whether someone engages in a criminal act or comes to be regarded as a criminal is influenced by the social learning and their social surroundings. The way in which crime is understood directly affects the policies developed on how to combat it. So again, if you have a lot of labeling theory that's happening within your society and you have a lot of things that are saying, hey, this particular group is going to do this particular thing, there's going to end up being a lot of laws or policies that directly impact the particular group, whether or not they have the intention to create um, any deviant behavior or to enact any kind of criminal activity. How do we document stuff? So we document crime by reporting crime statistics. Um, we have several different reports that we use. Criminology um, uses, in particular, the FBI database a lot. They use criminal crime reports, which are documents that hold official data on crime, such as that particular FBI reports. Um, beginning in the 1990s, crime rates began to decline nationwide. Some explanations for this decline posed by criminologists include better economic conditions and lower unemployment. Um, citizens ha have become more adapt to protecting themselves against crime um, with more um, so, uh, security systems, things of that nature. Um, policing has been more targeted and disciplined um, with police now using hotspot policing. We'll talk about that later. And there's been a drop in price maybe related to a decrease of drug use, which depends on your location and geography. All of that kind of depended on your geography. Compared to other industrialized nations, though, the United States has uh, relatively high rates of violent crime, which some people attribute to widespread um, availability of handguns and firearms, as well as um, a increase in social inequalities um, and um, ability to access economic um, needs. Yeah. Most likely explanation for high level of violent crime in the United States is a combination of availability of firearms, the general influence of the frontier tradition, um, and or the subcultures of violence in larger cities. Criminal, uh, criminal victimization. So crime and victimization are not random occurrences across the population, being young, black, and male. We're all associated with elevated death rates due to murder. And that's because of a lot of factors, right? But part of it is because of that, that label that gets put on these particular individuals. Um, emerging evidence suggests that sex, sexual and gender minorities may also have a higher risk of victimization. Generally, the um, across most data at this point is that tran Black trans women are the um, highest highest status of victimization in this country. Um, however, due to some of the um, ways in which they're reported, they can fall under being young, black, and male, depending, um, because their their gender um, ascription they have to themselves may not always be labeled. So that is something to look at when you're looking into data of this nature. Mm -hmm. Hate crimes are criminal activity by which an offender who is motivated by some kind of bias, such as racism, sexism, homophobia, um, transphobia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a hate crime is essentially, I hate this group of people so much that I'm going to go out and physically do violence to someone that exhibits the qualities of that group. 
Um, so who are the perpetrators? There's an imbalance in the ratio of men to women in prison. This is this is highly known. Um, the difference between male and female rates of crime are likely attributed to the difference of socialization and opportunity. So we socialize women in a very big way in this country to be um, more submissive and to um, adhere to particular kinds of um, social cues, including backing down, including um, being more quiet, including all of these things. Now, this also comes with a um, a language system that is taught for conflict resolution as opposed to confrontation. Um, and that also has a play in it. But a lot of the socialization for women is going to be very different than the socialization we do as a society for men. Um, and that's that does create differences in the um, social expectations and or um, the ways in which they socially interact with other people. Official statistics revealed that over one fifth of the people arrested for criminal offenses um, were younger than 21 or 21 or younger. So that's telling us that essentially that group is really struggling to have the means to essentially survive. But it also is telling us that that group um, is lacking some kind of social support in order to feel more connected to society in order to um, really choose other options than to engage in um, criminal activity or deviant behavior. Although criminologists have demonstrated that most young deviants go on to live law-abiding lives, there is still a panic about young criminality. Um, isolated events involved young people and crime are often transformed symbolically into full-blown crises of childhood and demand law and order responses. And so really the, what's, well, we'll talk about that. Crimes by people in positions of power and or wealth uh, can have far reaching consequences than petty crime. So essentially, when you talk about your white collar crime, you're talking about criminal activity carried out by those um, in professional jobs. You're going to see your frauds. You're going to see your um, embezzlement. You're going to see all of these things where it's going to likely affect a very large portion of a particular population, a lot more than, say, um, a guy who just went in and robbed one bank, right? That might come out with one teller being short. That might come out with um, that bank, that particular one institution having uh, lost some money out of this that they're likely insured for. Um, however, when you go into these white collar crimes where it's fraud on such a major level, it could be a multitude of institutions and it could be hundreds to thousands of people whose bank accounts get disrupted by this um, in ways that necessarily aren't fixable. Um, and so, and a lot of these, these people really rarely go to jail because they have access to um, networking and lawyers who are networked. <laughs> Um, and can afford essentially better help in the legal process, which in and of itself is telling you that socially um, those in powerful situations have more access to the political authority that makes laws in order to create this kind of gap between them and consequences. Um, corporate crime are offenses committed by large corporations, um, and those include uh, pollution, false advertising, and violations of health and safety um, regulations. You're going to see this a lot. Um, but again, you're going to see a lot less accountability um, for things of this nature. And again, that comes down to while we have housed the corporation with the same kinds of rights as personhood to an extent, we also have not done a great job about making sure the consequences are similar to those of personhood. And what we do end up doing is having a lot of corporations who have a lot of wealth and um, ability to lobby for laws that lessen the um, impact of, say, a violation to where they're just paying some money or something of that nature, as opposed to dealing with the real consequences that come out of whatever it is that they have um, done. So there's, again, six types of violations here. You've got administrative, environmental, financial, labor, manufacturing, and unfair trade practices. And all of these have um, 
a wide variety of consequences or lack of consequences um, and a wide variety of ways in which those things are perpetrated. The effects of corporate crime disproportionately affect those who are disadvantaged. Um, and so you're going to see a lot of, take pollution, for example, you're going to see a lot of waterways that get um, damaged and you're going to see a lot of that in very rural areas because those are the areas in which um, society is deemed we can put our toxic waste or what have you. But if that toxic waste has not been dealt with properly and ends up leaking into um, particular systems, you're going to see a lot of that happening in, say, on indigenous land, right? So you're going to see that happening to that marginalized population. Are you going to see that happen in very rural um, um, places with not a lot of wealth or not a lot of ability to transcend or move from those areas? Um, and so that's going to disproportionately impact essentially who is um, these populations that are already marginalized, whether it's economically, socially, or both. Um, so you have organized crime. Organized crime are things like um, uh, racketeering. You're going to see things like drug dealing. You're going to see things like illegal gambling. You're going to see things like <laughs> mobs. That's what we, right? So when we think about organized crimes, we're going to think about those like gang movies from the 1920s. Um, and while, yes, that that does fall under that, usually they are participating in some kind of other activity, whether it be um violence of some kind, whether it be drug dealing, whether it be gambling, whether it be theft, um, that those particular groups are going to also um, engage in some other form of crime. Um, but yeah, this is particularly carried out by organizations and they establish themselves as businesses. So they might be restaurant owners. They might be, um, they might own clubs. They might own um hotels they might it, it just depends on whatever that particular group has um decided to use as their money usually their money laundering operation um so prisons let's talk about prisons for a second the united states locks up more people per capita than any other country in the world i'm gonna say that one more time because this is important the united states locks up more people per capita than any other country in the world that's a big deal. Okay. So we have more people incarcerated, which puts more strain on our economic um, stability as a country, but also more strain on um, the system itself. And we're doing so in a way that is not beneficial to society as a whole, because we're not doing so in a way that um, we're creating citizens at the end of it, or that those people are coming out in any way re re rehabilitated or maybe educated in some way and, and um, have some kind of skill that they can then use afterwards, right? We're just throwing them into the same social and economic situations that might've caused the crime in the first place, which doesn't help us get any better. Um, critics have used the privatization of the, of the prison, prison industrial complex um, as something that has caused this. So when we moved our prison systems to be a for-profit industry, as opposed to say, a societal um, thing like transportation, which I mean, to an extent we're privatizing almost all of our social resources, such as our utilities and things of that nature, which is going to have consequences. Um, but when we did that, we made prisons far more expensive to the tax players. And we also made prisons um, a business, which meant that they needed clients and which meant that they needed a legal system that um, continued to bring in more and more people to the prison system. Mass incarceration has a particularly um, negative effect on Black communities, and African Americans are disproportionately represented in the prison population system. And what that means is essentially per capita, when you look at the nation as a whole and you divided it among racial categories, you're going to see percentages. Um, when it's just when they say things like disproportionate, disproportionately represented, they're going to say like maybe um, this particular group has 6% of the population as a whole, but is 30% of the prison population. And that's not accurate for this particular thing. I'm just trying to display a difference here, right? Um, it's actually, anyway, not the point. Um, and this is something that activists have been working on for an extended period of time. And it's something that has created a lot of social movements here in the United States and a lot of um, social um, disarray. 
uh, the mark of a criminal record. And it conduct, uh, so Pager uh, conducted an experiment to show how race played into long-term consequences of prison and the lives of felons. Her findings suggest that the experience of being a black male in America today is comparable with the experience of being convicted white criminal, at least in the eyes of Milwaukee employees. So essentially, being a black felon was a super hard thing to overcome. But if you were a white felon, someone who had been in the prison system and had proven socially um, that they were deviant in some way, you got the same consequences as a black person who had done nothing to to nothing in the way that is socially deviant with the exception of being labeled as socially deviant due to their their racial classification. Um, Pager's finding also talked about white men, white men were also preferred over black men and non-offenders were much more preferred over ex-offenders and what have you. White men um, with felony convictions were half as likely to be considered by employees as qualified white non-offenders um, and black ex-offenders where only one third is likely to receive a callback compared to black non-offenders. Um, so in other words, no matter who you were also, that if you carried this, carried this um, felon status compared to those who did not compare the fel felon status that also had all the other markers that you had, you generally had a far, um, you were far less likely to be hired or to go through the employment process. And in doing that, you're creating, again, economic means and economic barriers to being a functional member of society. Um, the death penalty. There's no evidence that the death penalty has co contributed in any way to lower um, rates in crime via by state or nationally. The United States' use of capital punishment is, a new, is very unusual among uh, liberal democratic nations. Support for capital punishment remains high in the U.S., though it has been declining in the last couple decades. One reason the death penalty remains legal in the United States is the idea that states' rights, which allows states to make decisions about the death penalty as opposed to a federal um, statute. Um, policing. During the 1990s, police forces grew significantly, and many scholars um, believe that accounted for 10 to 20 percent of overall crime decline. However, in increased policing presence um, has a steep social cost. Um, police practices such as stop and frisk um, or no-knock warrants have attracted attention for the effects on the communities and individuals of color. Overwhelmingly, young men of color are targeted by the police on a near daily basis. Uh, Victor Rios found that punitive policing created a culture of mistrust and resistance to authority, which um, also stems into a lack of resources for those who are actually in need um, of those services, such as those in domestic violence situations or in um, maybe child abuse situations. Um, even those who seldom broke the rules were perceived negatively by others in their community. Um, Stewart showed that policing caused heavy surveillance of Skid Row residents to the point that it has further restricted access to shelter work and meaningful social relations. There's um, more to lowering crimes than simply having police involved or present. Um, those things can also have negative societal impacts. Um, broken windows theory is a theory proposed that even small acts of crimes, uh, disorders, or vandalism can threaten a neighborhood and render it unsafe. Um, this was first proposed by Zimbardo. Um, it maintained that minor acts of deviance can lead to a spiral of crime and social decay. <laughs> this theory served as a basis for new policing strategies in the 80s and 90s that aggressively focused on punishing minor crimes. However, and, and we still see this a lot today, however, that doesn't necessarily track or translate to stopping major crimes. One flaw in the theory is the definition of social disorder is entirely up to the police. As crime rates fell through the 1990s, the numbers of complaints of police abuse and harassment went up, particularly by young black men who, in the eyes of the police, fit the profile of a potential criminal. Um, community policing, one idea that has grown in popularity in recent years, is that that police should work closely with citizens to improve local community standards and civil um, behavior using education, persuasion, and counseling instead of incarceration. So this is like, again, it, it's not saying that policing is going away, but it's saying that the way in which we're handling specific kinds of crimes that are not inherently super violent in nature um, is maybe with 
uh, drug rehab. It's maybe with um, increasing education chances. It's um, uh, talking about persuasion amongst the community and community building itself. And it's talking about counseling when it comes to mental health um, situations. Community policing a renewed is really a renewed emphasis on crime prevention rather than law enforcement engagement. Um, and that's really to evoke um, senses of community and really reestablish that um, those bonds. Benefits to um, of the crime decline. We have seen that there are a lot. There have been a downward trend in crime that um, and that the rise in mass um, incarceration is partly contributed to that crime. However, mass incarceration has also had a disproportionately negative effect on poor communities, particularly communities of color, especially um, those families uh, in communities of colors that end up losing one income to the household when times were already tough. That's going to create economic instability in ways that a lot of people cannot overcome. Um, Sharkley found that in communities where crime has gone down, the amount of violence has also decreased and children perform better in schools. Um, crime can take a toll on the financial and emotional well-being of everyone, even those who are not directly involved in the crime. Maintaining local and state and national criminal justice system is costly, and spending on corrections has risen dramatically over the past three decades. Um, in the absence of tax, tax hikes, lawmakers may find themselves forced to cut um, back on other social programs, including transportation, education, and health care, to foot the bill for these things. So again... We know that with better access to means comes less crime, but when we take away those access, those accessible programs to some of those means by doing things, say, like um, cutting those things to give maybe law enforcement um, new batons and riot gear, those two things are a juxtaposition that doesn't necessarily... Um, fit what it is that the statistics and really um, research shows us actually helps to um, take down crime um, within a community. Uh, the functions of deviants, as noted earlier, deviants also helps us understand what is considered right and wrong among peers, friends, and community members. Most people try hard to avoid deviants in order to um, avoid the stigmas and outcast treatment. Um, attached to that label and public humiliations are a consequence of deviance regularly whether you are guilty or not and so really that's where we're going to go kind of check out those questions if you have any comments concerns or questions um, please feel free to ask if you want more literature on anything that's in this chapter I have lots um, as again someone who studies trauma and those who are impacted by trauma. I also have to study the crimes in which those traumas um, are created. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you want or are looking for information on the topic. I hope you have a great week. I hope you've had a great week. Sorry, this video is a little late. Um, it won't be for those classes who get it in the future. <laughs> um, but as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks so much.